Thanks for joining us today. I'm the sustainable finance editor at Bloomberg News, like my colleague Rami just said. Um, so this is our new Good Business website we just launched this week, um, sponsored by Nuveen this week. Um, it's everything you need to know if you're an ESG investor. We have a link where you can subscribe to our Good Business newsletter. It's free. It's about read by about 25,000 people on Wall Street and companies that cover sustainability. Um, sustainable finance professionals. Um, it's a great way to find out thematically what's going on this week, what the markets are doing in green bonds, or sustainability-linked loans, or anything new in that space. So um, we hope you'll visit this page, um, tell your friends it's brand new, and um, a great landing hub for sustainable finance at Bloomberg. So I'm pleased to have Alex Bernhardt from Mercer join me on stage for our next conversation. I should lie down and we can make this a therapy session. I know, session. it's a uh, really great <laughs> <laughs> seat. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, well, let's talk about sustainability and how assets have been growing in this space. Um, this is such an interesting time to be covering this. I've been covering this space about three or four years and just seen assets sort of do this hockey stick thing that Peggy was talking about earlier. Um, and I think according to the Global Sustainability Alliance, 26% of assets under professional management globally are invested using some sort of responsible investing criteria. Um, people are always surprised by that number. <laughs> they don't know that that's so big. But we really want to look at the data here um, on our panel on ESG. Um, one thing we noticed at Bloomberg this year is that there were 140 different ESG funds that have launched globally this year. Um, Overall assets in the space, like my colleague Peggy had said, and you can see on this chart, 12 trillion, that's a quarter of US assets under management. Um, so tell me how Mercer has been playing in this space, Alex. What do you guys do, and how have you seen your sustainable finance and investment practice grow? Sure, thanks. Um, so Mercer is an investment consultant. We have about 11 trillion in assets under advisement globally, and our primary remit as an investment consultant is to help asset owners, pensions primarily, but also endowments and foundations uh, insurance companies, et cetera, to allocate their assets. So we help with asset allocation, and then we also help with manager selection within asset classes. And those are our two main core competencies. Uh, at Mercer, we've been at the forefront of responsible investing for a long time. We've had a responsible investment team for almost 15 years. Uh, we started at actually advising the UN on the formation of the PRI uh, in 2004 or thereabouts. Uh, and we've grown our team now to 15 people globally. Uh, I lead the, the US uh, branch of that, of that team. Uh, we have about four people here in, in North America. And we've been doing ESG-related uh, engagements with clients of all types and sizes for, for, for quite a while. So you talk to people all the time about ESG strategies and actually using them um, for their clients, for their investors, for their pension plan holders. Um, so what about this performance penalty? Do you still get questions about that? Is it a myth or is it how persistent is it? Oh gosh, yeah, that, that is the number one question that I still get today. Uh, and it is absolutely a myth. I will say that unequivocally. Um, but I think in order to really answer the question though thoroughly, uh, and Vijay did a great job uh, queuing that up, uh, I think we, we needed to make a distinction between the different approaches that, that investors take to responsible investing. So that you have SRI investing or socially responsible investing, uh, which it largely involves exclusionary approaches and, and active ownership uh, type approaches to, to creating change in company management practices. And you have ESG investing, which is about ESG integration and is less about values alignment and more about value generation. And then you also have impact investing, which I like to think of as a sort of concentrated ESG thesis, the way of, of really driving social and environmental change while also achieving um, financial returns. And in each of those categories of, of responsible investment or, or approaches to responsible investment, we have a pretty strong and robust research base that points to the fact that there is not a performance penalty and that there actually may be a uh, performance premium in some cases. And, and so I'll start with the SRI, SRI piece. If you'll forgive me the long-winded response. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, the number one thing that we, we hear uh, is I, you know, I don't want to be constrained. I don't want to take things out of my universe because I, I, I will, by definition, re reduce my risk-adjusted returns. And, and that definition, I think people forget, uh, hinges upon theory, like modern portfolio theory. It's, it's based in this uh, assumption that you know, markets are efficient and that if you reduce your, uh, your uh, investable universe, you're going to move farther away from the efficient frontier. And 
well, that is true theoretically. What the empirical evidence really hasn't borne it out. Yeah. Well, let's let's look at some of those evidence. This yeah, is yeah. a um, study here from Hermes Investment An Management, and it shows the effect on portfolios of eliminating all these things that the SRI investors actually eliminate: alcohol, gambling, tobacco. It was from 2016. But it's still sort of the only thing I've seen like this out there. Um, but it seems like actually eliminating energy the past few years has been a good bet, um, or that there's not such a huge bet. Um, and these are such a huge cost that you can't make it up with other advantages of the ESG strategy. Is that what you tell clients? Exactly. I mean, that's what the empirical evidence shows. There's another great study that, that's similar to this one that GMO uh, did recently, where they actually excluded every major industry sector in the uh, in the MSCI GICs from from the S&P 500 and uh, back tested about 25 years. And the differences in, in returns uh, between between the, the lowest returning uh, you know, pretend index and the uh, model index and the highest performing index was like 50 basis points maybe. Um, and so basically, the, and, and the S&P 500, the actual index itself, was in the middle. And so what, what, what it shows uh, and what that last chart shows is that exclusionary investing does not guarantee you a performance penalty, but it does, it does guarantee you basis risk or the risk of tracking error that your portfolio Will not match the index, and so if you, you know, cannot tolerate that kind of basis risk or, or tracking error, then uh, then exclusionary investing may not be for you. But from a long-term risk-adjusted return standpoint, it's really hard to say that there's empirical evidence that universally you're guaranteed a, a penalty in that context. Yeah, well, let's talk about risk in this space for a little bit because it seems like ESG is a great risk avoidance strategy well, potentially mm -hmm. for people um, if you actually, you know, look out over a long period of time. It depends on your time horizon, right? But um, yeah, is that Enough for a source of returns. Uh, well, uh, again, I think the evidence the evidence says yes. Uh, I mean, there there are have been well over two thousand primary studies done on the uh, influence of ESG on on long term company financial performance, and overwhelmingly, those studies have shown a, a non negative, <laughs> which is to say, either a positive or or a neutral impact uh, of ESG integration on on company financial performance. Which so that only a small portion of studies actually show that ESG integration has been negative. Uh, and so, uh, you know, while that's not maybe the most convincing uh, argument, it is nevertheless. It shows that ESG integration is at least a, a zero loss, uh, a zero loss game. I mean, it's something that you can probably get returns from if you if you do it well. And then, you know, to that point, we're also seeing more evidence emerging on the importance of materiality to ESG evaluation. If you actually take time to, rather than just taking you know, blanket ESG data, uh, if you actually take time to find the most material ESG metrics and the, and the highest quality ESG metrics and map them to your your portfolio uh, to the industry sectors and countries and and is individual issuers that are the um, the most exposed to those ESG metrics, you can actually generate higher degrees of alpha. Yeah, one of the um, most read stories I wrote in the past few years was this study by George Serafine out of Harvard, where he showed yep, that exactly materiality, the, um, the companies that focus on the most material sustainability metrics to their business do better than the ones that focus more on immaterial metrics to their business. So that materiality focus is really interesting, um, given that still the area of sustainability reporting is developing and the data is such a challenge. Is that, um, or it's just growing. It's it's new in a lot of cases. Right. Sometimes it's the first year companies report some sustainability information. Um, how can investors sort of manage that newness of data and data quality and changes? It's a great, great question. I mean, I, I well, first of all, on a positive note, I mean, ESG data is getting better and it is evolving rapidly. Right, we have a huge portion of large companies that are are disclosing their ESG, uh, their ESG metrics, um, and and increasingly investors are asking for this information, which is it's a self-reinforcing cycle. Um, but yeah, you're you're right. The ESG data landscape is pretty messy, and the, you know, there's, by by one count, it was the RateSustainability.org website, which I think Bloomberg sponsored. I'm not sure where it's gone, but <laughs> there were 150. Uh, bring it back. There were 150 ESG data providers uh, in the landscape, in the marketplace at one point. Uh, there's been some consolidation in that space, so it may be a lower number now, but 150 data providers offering 650 data products, and they're all garnering data from similar sources, you know, company disclosures, uh, be, they, be they public or uh, otherwise. Um, and uh, it's hard to make sense of the, the signals in that noise, but, but because there's so much data out there, I think th there has to be signals in it. I mean, the, 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 <laughs> The uh, the idea the, the idea that there isn't a, a you know value signal in there is, is kind of hard to understand, and, and similarly I think for investors looking to integrate ESG into their process, it's really important to take a forward looking view. I mean the, the whole the whole point behind ESG investing is to make your portfolio more resilient to an uncertain future. Right, we have things like climate change happening. We've got unprecedented level unprecedented levels of social inequality in certain parts of the world. 
uh, we've got you know, political unrest, and all of these things are very difficult to analyze with financial information alone. You need to take a qualitative view as well as a, an ESG lens on your, on your investments to capture those long-term, sometimes systemic or secular risks. Uh, otherwise, you might miss them. Yeah, um, it's interesting. We were just, one of my big stories in the past few weeks was on um, Nissan and the whole scandal that happened with their chairman, Carlos Ghosn, getting arrested over his compensation plan. And um, we looked at ESG funds and how they bet on that space. And um, they did look at ratings. And I think Nissan actually ranked at the bottom in terms of governance ratings for several ESG providers in the auto industry. Um, and only five out of 60 US ESG funds that invest internationally actually had shares of Nissan when the scandal hit. Um, it was kind of interesting in terms of risk avoidance. Um, is that something that people ask you about when they're investing in ESG? Yeah, definitely. I mean, ESG is, is primarily today really positioned as, as a, a risk uh, avoidant mechanism, as a way of, of, of managing risk and looking more holistically at the companies or, or other securities issuers that you might invest in in the, in the bond market. And that would be something we could talk about more. <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely heard of yeah. um, some asset managers say that they they give it a sort of a hedge on all the other risks in their portfolio, that they want some impact in renewable energy companies to sort of hedge that risk. Yeah. Um, so another question is, what about SIN stocks? Don't they outperform? That's sort of the theory. We were talking, <laughs> Alex and I were talking about this, uh, the ACT index, which is um, the vice index and invest in SIN stocks. And when it launched a few years ago, it was actually like up way more than the S&P. But now this year, actually, it's down 7% year to date, um, and the S&P is up 4.3%. So um, is investing in SIN stocks, is that, is that over, or is that still a thing? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a great question. I mean, the, the last year maybe proves the socially responsible investor's point that these, have, these SIN stocks have been uh, long-term risks that you maybe don't want to take in your portfolio. I mean, keeping the social issue or the values-oriented issue aside, I mean, they, they may well have been uh, fiduciary risks that, that you didn't want to have in your portfolio. Um, but you know, the, there have been studies recently that have looked at the sustainable, what seemed to be sustainable outperformance of those SIN stocks up until the last year, uh, and most of the most of their outperformance is actually attributable to factor exposures that you can get uh, otherwise in your portfolio. So if you exclude those and then optimize your portfolio to maintain exposure to those same factors, size, uh, and and the various quality factors in the uh, five five factor from a French framework <laughs> framework, which is a mouthful. Uh, uh, you can actually you know, minimize your exposure to loss. So what about incorporating things like climate risk into portfolios? Um, one thing that Bloomberg just did an analysis of um, carbon intensity in funds, and that's something the ESG investors are really focused on. Mm -hmm. um, and we found the average carbon intensity for the Europe stock 600 is 177.3 tons of carbon per million dollars of sales compared with the S&P, which is 197.8 tons. So it seems like the S&P has like way more carbon than stocks in, are you, in Europe. And are you seeing um, that start to play out in the market? Like even though there's no real price on carbon globally, um, is that starting to affect asset values and investment strategies? Well, it's a, that's a great question. I mean, one of the more, from the institutional investor market perspective, one of the more common uh, ESG investment strategies that is being adopted, especially by, by U.S. investors and, and also also in Europe, uh, is actually a low carbon index strategy. In part because it's easy to do. Uh, carbon data, while it's not perfect, is pretty readily available. It's one of the more readily available ESG metrics that we have. And uh, you know, I've heard this: uh, the, the low carbon indices described as as pr providing a free put uh, against climate risk, basically. And so you can, if you're especially if you're a large investor, you can set up a a separate account that tracks a low carbon index and at the, pretty much the same fees or similar fees and uh, and then achieve a, a downside risk protection hedge in the event that climate, uh, carbon does get priced. And so we're seeing that more and more. And it's really interesting what you say about the data quality, that there's really sort of an accepted standard for reporting carbon intensity right now. And there's other assets like that, like uh, the gender lens strategies I've seen really take off <coughs> lately. And it's, it's kind of hard to fudge the data on how many female employees you have or that yeah. sort of thing. <laughs> so. That's true. I, though we, we do, I mean, so most of the, the, the gender indices are, and they're, and they're great. I'm really glad that we're innovating in this space. We need to go deeper, and, and we will. Uh, but right now, they're, they're focused, a lot of them are focused on board level representation <laughs> and, and don't even go into sort of senior management level representation. And so we need to, we need to go deeper uh, and look at, at the, uh, you know, the, whole, the whole spectrum of employees at companies and, and other human capital management practices more broadly. Now, I wanted to go back to this um, modern portfolio idea you were talking about before, because I think that's a really interesting topic for us to go to before we go to questions. So get your questions ready. Um, is that you know people forever have sort of mapped this historical economy, and sometimes ESG investors have told me sort of their um, 
they're finding the winners of the legacy economy right now if you use modern portfolio theory versus ESG, which is probably a chance to map the future. Mm -hmm. And um, is, that, is that what you see, or wh where's that potential in that? I, I, that's exactly what I see. I mean, I, I, if, ha, how, okay, I'll ask a question. How many people here use investment tools in their day-to-day -day work that are rooted in some form of the modern portfolio theory math, CAPM, or some model? A lot of people, okay, yeah. <laughs> and so that, the, those typically rely on, primarily on back-tested information to develop forward-looking assumptions. And you know, there are many different ways of, of modeling, uh, you know, modeling portfolios. But again, historical information still remains the, the primary input. And, and there really isn't a clear way to input ESG into, into those sort of uh, risk modeling frameworks. Um, and so you know, without, without taking that, that overlay and looking at the ESG fa factors in your portfolio and, and doing some sort of perhaps qualitative, maybe quantitative adjustment to your portfolio to address those ESG risks, you'll miss things like, like Nissan. You'll, you'll, you'll miss things like um, stranded asset risk in, in fossil fuels potentially, so. Great, well Lauren, do we have any questions from the audience? We do, our first questioner at says, I often hear investors casually dismiss performance data by saying, I just don't see it. Is the challenge data or culture? And how can firms overcome cultural resistance to responsible investment? What was the last thing you said? <laughs> how, can how, can, how can firms overcome a cultural resistance? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, the, the data the data isn't that convincing in part because, uh, I mean, there's there's lots of research, but the the ESG data landscape is messy, and you know, quants uh, want uh, you know really clear signal. Uh, you know, they want the value premium or the, the small cap premium. They want that equivalent in ESG, and and we're just not going to have that today because of the the data quality issues. And so we do need to have a cultural shift if we're going to adopt these ESG investment processes. We we need. Uh, to acknowledge that that ESG data is actually really beneficial and, and utilitarian for, uh, again, rendering your portfolio resilient to future change. What are the limitations of backtesting ESG ESG strategies? Uh, well, uh, we've talked a lot about that already. Uh, I, the, the limits are data data quality issues primarily. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, but I, I didn't fully answer the last question. So on, on culture, uh, I mean, we do a lot of education at Mercer. I, I, I spend. A, huge amount of my time uh, with boards and committees uh, just telling them about the basics of ESG, saying things like I've, I've said <coughs> up here today, and just making sure that the myths are, are busted. <laughs> and so if all of you can go back to your boardrooms and your committee rooms and, and say, hey, you know, actually there isn't a performance penalty here, maybe we should be taking this issue seriously, that'll go a long way to addressing uh, the cultural issue, I think. How do you overcome the lack of standardization in ESG reporting? Uh, Pressure. We need long-term investor coalitions to really press uh, the regulator uh, as well as uh, individual companies to uh, to disclose more and more in line with standards uh, like the SASB standards, uh, Sustainability Accounting Standards Boards. If you if you haven't haven't heard of it, um, and and make sure that the data quality does get uh, does get better over time. Specifically around the conversation on SIN stocks. Given that energy, high energy consumption of data mining operations, should blockchain companies be part of SIN stocks? <laughs> That's a great question as well. Uh, <laughs> is the next question going to be about cannabis? <laughs> <laughs> I passed. Not too late to ask. I think there was uh, like yeah. a merger today where some tobacco <laughs> company bought a cannabis company. Uh, um, let's see. I, well, right now, uh, data. Um, Data farms represent a really small portion of global emissions. So today it's not it's not a problem, but you can definitely you know, block the energy intensity of blockchain is is a serious issue and one that we need to be paying attention to as blockchain related businesses start to start to build out, because um, then we will see tech becoming a big driver of, of global emissions. Uh, luckily, a lot of tech firms are committing to 100% renewables, and so they're powering their data centers with uh, you know, with wind and solar primarily. So um, you know, that might have an offsetting effect. Do you see asset managers passing on the alpha from ESG to investors or keeping it in the form of higher fees? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I, fees are going down. <laughs> fees, there's so much fee pressure from, from us and from investment, uh, larger investment institutions that fees are, are going down across the board. And, and still I see in the marketplace, this is another question I get a lot, which is related, I see a lot of ESG funds, uh, a lot of concern that ESG funds cost more. It's, uh, you know, it's not, not always true, uh, you can do your own fee analysis, and you'll see that there are some ESG funds that are more expensive than, say, their peers, but some that aren't. Uh, so it's not there's no hard and fast, hard and fast rule. But uh, 
if there are like an ESG branded, if there is an ESG branded product and a mainstream branded product in the same say product suite, and one is more expensive than the other, I really question that. Like, what what's the merit of, of charging more for an ESG product? Um, <coughs> yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Time for one more. Okay. How can we use ESG information in a forward-looking way? What trends should we be looking at on improving ESG performance? Uh, so you, you really need to uh, take a view on on total uh, top-down level systemic issues that, that are occurring. Uh, I think it, it needs to start with a top-down perspective um, and, and try and understand how issues like climate change and social inequality and, and others are really driving shifts in the macro economy. And, and from there, I think you can start to understand what the impacts on um, on industry sectors and individual companies might be. But, but taking that sort of long-term view and, and looking at the big systemic issues and the, and the sustainability trends that we're, we're seeing evolve right now, uh, you can then really understand what's going to drive long-term return opportunities as well as, as well as risks. So I think start there. Well, thank you so much for a great conversation, Alex. Thank I really you, enjoyed yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you.